Hey, everybody, it's Ryan from Pi Records, and I'm here with Joe Castro from the mighty Joe Castro and the Graveman. How are you? Good, good. How you doing, man? Awesome. One of the cool things that I found out or you found out about, about us that is that we're very close. You're right down the street in Collegeville, PA. Yeah, yeah, we're almost neighbors. Probably, what, like, I don't know, four or five miles away, something yeah. like that, you know? Yeah, probably that's pass awesome. each other at the... the Probably pass each other the giant tons of times never even knew it or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, right, right. And I go to that Target a lot. They have good stuff there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's essential, fortunately. But yeah. So uh, let's 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 start off. Uh, I, I guess talking about your music and the inspiration behind your sound. You have a couple songs that are super bluesy, and then you have a couple songs that are like like uh more rockabilly ish uh where do you yep. get your your inspiration from is it the 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 the, the 50s 60s of, of course for sure yeah uh, uh for this band a lot of the inspiration came from a lot of music from the from the 50s um you know i grew up listening to a lot of that stuff my parents were first generation rock and rollers i was born in, in new york and my my mom was like a first generation elvis fan and loved johnny cash and my dad grew up going to show the Alan Freed shows in New York at the Brooklyn Paramount. So he would tell us stories about that. So, you know, growing up as a kids in the seven, as a kid in the seventies, there was just tons of fifties nostalgia around all those movies that were out yeah. like American graffiti, um, Greece, yep. uh, American out wax, that soundtrack, listening to all that stuff was just from like an early age, just sort of, um, you know, gotten in my blood. And I've always had like a soft spot for, for fifties music. So with this band, it's something that I always wanted to do something that was very rockabilly influenced um but i wanted to make sure that we were doing original songs and um not just covers and that the songs had to be sort of uh updated um lyrically and both sonically so it wasn't just sort of like a like a tribute act i didn't want it to be um like yeah. cosplay where you're dressing up like a 50s guy and doing that thing so i we we usually say we're kind of like we sound like Buddy Holly if he had access to a bunch of effects pedals and some Nick <laughs> records. That's sort of like our ether, you know, to take, to go back to like the root of rock and roll and that original sound, and then sort of add every, every, all the good stuff that's come after that, incorporate that in, you know, that, that's it, sort of like, like up, up, update it without losing the spirit of the thing. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like uh, when the, the Reverend Horton, he kind of went back to his roots and yeah, did, did more of a rockabilly style. It kind of, some of the stuff reminds me kind of of that. Yeah, yeah, we definitely have a heavy rockabilly influence, and you know we've got the upright bass player, so that automatically puts yeah. you in that sort of category. But, um, but yeah, I love all that early rock and roll stuff, and you know, um, yeah, just good energy, like high energy, uh, all that kind of stuff, just rock and roll. I think like you have to sort of say rockabilly now because if you say rock and roll, it means so many different things, different people. Yeah, you know, like it, it can mean heavy metal, it can mean you know rock, like you know it just doesn't that term doesn't even mean anything anymore so i think what we play is closer to original rock and roll not rock music but like rock and roll and the, the role part yeah. is very important there the danceability aspect of it so speaking of danceability when you when you put on a show is that is that the the goal um to get people up dancing like what are your shows like for sure yeah um this this band yeah people definitely get up dancing i mean sometimes you have traditional swing dancers and sometimes you get people that just get up and want to move around and um yeah there's there's definitely always people dancing pretty pretty much um which is just which is just cool you know i don't like going to shows where people are just sort of standing there in the corner looking around like you know once one person gets uh gets the guts to go out there you usually other people follow but it's not as like traditional like swing dancing is as a lot of other places like it's not sort of like if you don't know how to do it you can't come there's some people that'll that'll swing dance and, and do that and other people just come there and just just dance around and have a good time it's a mix awesome awesome so being in collegeville how did you hook up with a a, a bunch of rock and rollers and and i don't know kind of develop this sound in the kind of in the middle of nowhere well, I, I moved here four or five years ago because my, my wife is from the area 
And um, before that, I played ba in bands in Philadelphia and, and Delaware um, and did some touring and stuff like that around. So I had some connections. But when I moved out here, it sort of gave me a good chance to sort of cleanse my palate and try to think and do something different. So um, it's just something that I've always wanted to do. And I just, our, our bass player at the time, Hoover, had reached out to me and about um, starting a band because he heard some of my stuff and knew that I was, that's what I was looking to do. So once I had the upright bass, he found that our drummer Dallas uh, came from a Philadelphia band called Thorzine, who were big in yeah. the nineties. Um, yeah, you know them. Yeah, yeah. Dallas and Hoover played together in Thorzine, and um, so we got them backing us up. And then we found our guitar player Michael Stingle um, through an online ad, and it really fell together within a couple months. And then we, with I think our first full band practice was in January of two thousand eighteen. We played our first show. March of that year, and we released our first EP that June, you know, so we were like, we had the songs and everyone picked them up really quick and we just went and started going full steam ahead. That's awesome. Uh, being being um, a resident of Delaware uh, for a little while, I, I loved yep. being able, being so close to Philadelphia and being able to go up yeah. and see shows there um so that must have been a great time for you tell me a little bit about your time in the music scene yeah in, uh, i grew Philly. up in like i said i was born in new york and then i grew up in delaware and spent my formative years um down there and so i was you know as late teens early 20s i was involved in, in music scene in newark delaware and wilmington delaware went to shows at all kinds of you know the barn door and the foreign one and then went up to do shows in philly at the kyber and places like that upstairs yeah. at nicks and all that stuff in the 90s and um i was in a band down there called nero and later a band called swing line and then in the early 2000s i was in a philadelphia band called the situation um which put out a couple of records on a label from ohio called elephant stone records um had kind of a brit poppy british rock sound to it garagey and um did that for like five or six years but yeah played all over in philadelphia all, all over a lot of people don't know philly as a rich uh, rock and roll, punk rock, uh, blues scene, jazz, a lot of underground, a lot of underground venues. Um, there was a band that was similar to you guys, more punk rock. They were called Grieving Eucalyptus, and they used to come down and play in Philly all the time. I don't know if you remember them. Okay, the name sounds familiar. Name sounds familiar, yeah. And uh, I've seen it, but the name sounds familiar. Yeah, they they went when they put their full length out. They went like pretty much your direction, like straight ahead rock and roll. They didn't have an upright bass, but uh, the the themes were there, you know. Yeah, like in the '90s too. Even though I wasn't playing rock and roll, I used to go out and see a bunch of bands like the Three Blue Teardrops, who are out of Chicago. Um, the Reach Around Rodeo Clowns, Quentin Jones, who's right out from a, you know, he's based out in the Lancaster area, and they used to come around and play and stuff. Stuff like that so anytime that stuff came around i always you know liked seeing it uh, you know and as well as stuff like reverend heat and the stray cats and that kind of thing oh yeah brian setzer spent a lot of time in philadelphia when he was younger yeah yeah i know that he um actually when i was in i went to school at drexel and i had a, a shop teacher there who was in a band called uh bunny drums who were like a really early 80s sort of joy division -y kind of band but he would always tell me stories about um Brian Setzer's band coming down from New York and playing, they used to be called the Bloodless Pharaohs. And so he was like close with, with Setzer for a few years. And so he would tell the stories about that, which was pretty, pretty cool. Awesome. Do you know uh, Rick from the Ultra Kings? No, I know that band, but I don't, I haven't met them before. No. We, uh, we interviewed him on the show and uh, he, he's a, they're a good rockabilly band. If you, uh, if you if you've heard them, uh, they they fall right down right down in the middle of the rockabilly. Yeah, I think we I'm pretty sure we follow each other on Instagram. Actually, there's like a there's a lot of those kind of bands out there these days. Um, yeah, the the problem is he has to travel from where he is to play shows. Like you have to travel yeah. a long distance, and but uh, he has a lot, like you said, a lot of swing dancers at the shows and stuff like that. And uh, yeah. their their music is really good. If you could ever play a show with them, I would definitely come out and see you guys. 
Yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully we can make that happen. Yeah. There's, there's like pockets of them everywhere. And it seems like, you know, down in the South that there's still a much stronger, um, scene of that, like in Nashville and Memphis and those areas yeah. where you sort of play a lot and make and t- Texas and make some money up here. It's a little bit harder. So we try to travel as much as we can. Um, obviously we haven't gone out to play a lot of shows, uh, you know, since, since COVID happened, but, um, we're definitely looking this year to get on the road and, and playing out to as many people as possible. I mean, Europe's big too. There's so many rockabilly bands and yeah, that scene in Europe is like huge. Yeah. Like, like so the hurt- love to get out there. The Hurricanes, the Broadway Twisters, the Barn Twisters. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's, there's, there's so many bands out there, and LA too. I mean, like Southern California has a lot of rockabilly bands out that way. Um, you know, there's so many great ones. Like we, I saw the Delta Bombers over the summer from Las Vegas. They were great. Um, Screaming Rebel Angels, we're friends with from New York. Um, Lara Hope and the Arctones are awesome. I drew in the blue. We're from Reading, Pennsylvania kind of do like rock rock or early like garagey surf music um they're awesome we play with them a lot uh lonesome dave fisher out of baltimore um yeah there's there's um oh, uh, sean k preston and the loaded pistols friends there's so there's so many there's, yeah. there's tons i'm gonna forget some people and they're gonna be upset that i didn't mention <laughs> did you guys ever get to play out at the silo i did with another band but not with not in this band yet no but um, we've played Reading a few times, and we just played there recently at that at the Nitro Bar in okay. West Reading reopening, um, which was last Tuesday night, which was a blast. I mean, for a Tuesday night, they had a great crowd. It was packed. People were just ready to have a good time. I mean, it was one of the funnest shows we played at in a long time. And the fact that it was on a Tuesday night just blows my mind. Yeah, yeah. Did you say that was in West Reading? Yeah, West Reading, yeah. I lived there for um, a little bit, too. <laughs> Oh, cool. It's right on that main strip. Like, do you know where the American diner is down there? Yeah. Right across the street from this diner. And there's yeah. a record shop down in the corner that you walk down into. I can't remember the name of it across the street. Vertigo? It's right on that block. Yeah, that's the one, I think. And it's yeah. um, it's right across. Super cool room. Um, they get a lot of great bands there. And uh, it's cool. It's a cool little bar. It's got a great vibe, like old, like... Uh, vintage motorcycle advertisements on the wall and like old yeah. horror movie posters and stuff like that. Just got a, a great jukebox. Good vibe. Worth but, checking out if you're up in that area again. Yeah, man. West Reading is like one of those towns, those uh, small towns next to a city where you, you, you could go like Jim Thorpe, where you could just go and visit yeah. and spend the day checking out all the cool shops and the diners and, uh, and, I think it, it, you know, from what the way you were talking about being being packed on a Tuesday night, that's you, your type of music fits in perfectly with that area. Yeah, yeah. I guess they said that it's mainly they do it on Tuesday nights because it's mostly like restaurant staff that come out, so all those people have to work on Friday, Saturday, Thursday night at restaurants, bartenders. Tuesday night they have all they have, maybe they have off on Wednesday and they have no place to go. So they all come to the Nitro Bar on Tuesday nights and they pack it out. And it's great. It took me a little while to convince the rest of the band to drive up because most of them live out in Philadelphia. So it's a bit of more of a hike for them to come in on a Tuesday night on a school night, you know, and go play. But um, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. It was a blast. It was so much fun. But I, I bet they found it was worth it when they came up, though. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think so. They may not have felt that the next morning, but yeah, it was yeah. great. It was, it was good. And, you know, it's like the shows are over by 10 30 or 11 so it's not like you're out like till 2 a.m and and, and yeah happen, you know like we played from 9 till 10 it wasn't that ba- big of a deal is that what your your typical set con- consists of is like one 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 hour show usually that's what i like like a like a like an hour set but um we have done some some like three hour shows or maybe we'll do like three one hour sets um if a club wants us to do that i don't always like doing that um I like it just sort of short and sweet and powerful. Like I definitely come from that sort of Ramones, uh, you know, like stage thing where you get on stage and you're just like, boom, one song and the next one, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like the Ramones in the class. Like I grew up on that stuff. So like from a live standpoint, we want to hit you with the energy and just go out and just burn as bright as we can for, you know, an hour. Yeah. Um, But we we have done it. We've done like some festivals and stuff, outdoor gigs where they want you to play for a long time and we can do it. And it's cool. It's just like, it's the difference between like doing a sprint and a marathon, you know? Yeah. It's like a little different vibe. Gotta, you gotta kind of pace yourself. 
Yeah, and you got to throw in a little more covers because you know, like three hours of songs that people might not be totally familiar with is tough. So, and we don't have three hours worth of original material. So, in those kind of things, we throw in some fun covers. But even when we do covers, we don't do them like uh like copycat like uh, like versions for lack of a better word like yeah we cover the ramones oh oh i love her so but we do it sort of in a style of like like a dion song or something like we will take we take them and just oh nice mess them and make them make them our own you know and um you know we do this old song from the 80s by this band called the godfathers called birth school work death and um you know we just try to like pull stuff that from our at least i try to pull stuff that i liked growing up as a teenager and then sort of mix that into our into our style you know because i i grew up in the late 80s and listened to all that 120 minute stuff you know like, oh yeah um, yeah i remember you that know, the smiths and the cure and then echo and the bunny man and the godfathers yeah. and the cult and you know and then punk rock and the minute man and you know husker do and stuff like that um yeah i still like all that like seeps into what we what we do um as well as stuff like tom waits and bob dylan and leonard cohen and stuff so Oh, yeah, Leonard yeah. Cohen, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for lyrics, you can't beat that guy. I mean, yeah. Him and him, him and Waits and Dylan and Nick Cave and, you know, even Connor O'Burst, oh, those kind of guys just always, are always like the, the, the top shelf you try to aspire to, you know? The, the first time I heard Tom Waits was in the movie Pump Up the Volume. Do you remember that movie? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I watched that again recently. Did you? And it was written and it, and it held up. I found it on Amazon. And I was like, oh, wow, pump up the volume. And I was, I watched it and I thought it held up. It, it was still fun. Like it was still good. Yeah. It was like, um, totally like, I think it was a pretty big movie, but all the music, yeah. it, all the music in the, in there was like all, all the alternative stuff at the time. And, uh, yeah. I think it was a really great movie. It came out at a great time. Great soundtrack. Great. Yeah, but that's how I think the first time I heard Leonard Cohen was on that because they had yeah. that Everybody Knows song, you know, he's driving yeah. around in the dark at night. And I'm, I mean, for like, if you watch that movie at a certain age, a certain time, it was like, you, you couldn't help but be like, this, this is pretty cool, you know? Yeah. Like every kid wanted to sort of do that. And um, yeah, I, I, yeah, go ahead and check it out again. It's worth it. It's worth a watch for sure. That was, at the time, that, that movie was one of my favorites. And then, and then later on in the movie, I, I think it was Concrete Blonde covered that song. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you are. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you are right. Yeah. Yeah. And watching it now, like there's so many other little things you start noticing, like posters you had in the walls and stickers and things. Yeah. And like, you know, there's like replacement songs in there and stuff. And you're like, man, well, yeah. this is like 1988 or 89 or something like it, 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 They were like a, ahead of the curve, you know, that was pretty yeah. grunge and all that stuff. So like they was definitely, yeah. definitely tuned in. It was, it's cool. It's a good film. It was cool when they when they pan down the uh, the, the stack of uh, cassette tapes and there's Henry Rollins band there and and yeah. uh, and the Descendants and and like he just had like a I I I guess uh, Richard Hell was one of the songs that he played on that show. Yep. Uh, yep, Love yep. comes in spurts and it was just a just a great great mix of uh i don't know from for my for my teenage years you couldn't beat that movie unless you were gonna watch like dogtown or something like that yeah yeah i mean it was cool because it it didn't the music didn't seem contrived it wasn't like they got some person like picking a playlist that was going to sort of be the hippest coolest stuff at the moment like like you could tell like someone who put that together was a music fan and really liked that kind of stuff because there were obscure things in there like little references i don't know if it was a direct or the set design or whoever but you start picking up on things and you're like wow man this it may it makes it just that much cooler you know it was it was a perfect transition into the 90s because she's wearing the bowling shirt and then in the 90s yep. she had a lot more uh punk rock alternative and and a lot of rockabilly especially in philadelphia at that time uh, a lot of rock and roll yeah. bands and it kind of just segued into that was that uh, was that album part of your, I, I guess your early '90s music uh, career? W- w- was was that one of the movies that that kind of triggered you into like I got to pick up a guitar and do this? That's a good question. Um, I mean that that album that 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 movie was great. Uh, I don't know if it I wouldn't no no I'd say if it influenced me as far as picking up a guitar. I just 
at the time, like I just, I, I was so into bands like the Smiths and I didn't think at the time I could sing like Morrissey. So I wanted to play to play the guitar like Johnny Marr because he was my favorite guitar player. So I yeah. just got a guitar from someone and didn't take lessons, just sort of would teach myself from reading a uh, guitar magazine. Remember the old guitar magazines we had yeah. in the back that was just a ta the tablature. And yeah. At the time it was all pretty much heavy metal songs because that's that's only the kind of thing that they put in guitar magazines. So I would just sit yeah. there and learn to play guitar with like a song by Metallica or like Tesla or something. Yeah. Just so I could figure out and build up the hand strength and later tried to figure out songs by by other bands. But I mean there's so many influences. Um and I'm a movie nut, like I watch a ton of films. So uh yeah, I, I don't know. Um I didn't even start singing though till much too much later on. I was just for years and years just a guitar player in a band. I didn't have any interest in writing songs or or or, or singing or anything like that. That came later. So uh, where in Collegeville are, are some good spots to, uh, or Phoenixville <clears throat> for that matter? What, what are some of the hot spots that you like to, uh, to hit out there? Um, even if you're just hanging out for good music yeah. or places you'd like to play? Well, one place I, lo I love to hang out is Matone's record shop. Uh, the guy who runs it, Adam, Adam Matone, is great. Um, and actually, one of the first things when I moved here, when I moved here, his shop opened maybe within months of each other. So it was pretty, it was great. And for a while, he was doing open mic nights. And I started meeting other musicians there, just going there and performing at the record shop and just hanging out. But even now, you can walk in there and, like, just scope through records. Like, he always will pull something that he has recommended that he thinks that I like. And it's just, like, a great, a great vibe. And, like, it's a great hub to go there and, like, sort of check out and, like, meet people and just, you know, shoot the breeze or whatever. Um, but Matone's on Main Street in Collegeville is a must. Um, in Phoenixville, we recently played this spot called the Sound Bank, which is a really cool music venue. Um, and I'm going to be playing there again in March doing some ac an acoustic show. I believe it's on St. Patty's Day. Um, you know, I love the Colonial Theater, man, in, in, yeah. uh, in, in Collegeville. It's just classic. There's a really good bookshop across the street from there called Reeds & Company. There's a cool little record shop that opened up in Phoenixville as well called Forever Changes. It's pretty new. Um, those are like my main spots, man. And there's awesome. diners like Nudies and things like that. You know, yeah. the Collegeville Diner. I go there for breakfast all the time, man. I, that's my favorite. Shorty's over in Pottstown, you know, Shorty's Sunflower Cafe. You ever been out yep. that spot? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. There's so just there's one uh, really good there. Mexican restaurant in an alley on Phoenixville. Have you, in Phoenixville. Have you seen that? I think I've driven by that one. Is it good? Yeah. Yeah. You don't know you don't know the name of it, do you? It just says Mexican food. Yeah, I think I know the sign you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, I bet it's good, but those are always the best ones too. Yeah, right. You find this little hole in the wall. You take a chance, you'll find one and be like, "This is the spot. This is the spot." Oh, totally. I check that out now. So it's, well, I, I haven't found a lot of good Mexican food in this area, so I there, have to find something like. There's that. one in Pottstown, uh, right, right by the mall, where the old Pizza Hut and KFC used to be. There's a Mexican restaurant there yeah. right now by the Wawa, and okay. It's, it's excellent, excellent food. Uh, I, I, I don't know how to pronounce the name, uh, but it's owned by the guys who own Giovanni's. Okay, I think I know the spot you're talking about. I haven't been there, but I'll check it out. Have you been to that place uh, called Rivet in Pottstown? It's a new music venue. Um, no, it's in Pottstown? Yeah, it used to be like an old furniture store or something. But the guy, one of the guys who, I think it was the DJ for Bloodhound Gang. Super oh, nice yeah. Name. He runs that place, but they got a great sound system. It's a good room. We did a show there with Drew in the Blue in um, like last year in, in the fall, and it was a blast. Great venue. Great venue. Hopefully, we're going to play there again soon. Oh, my but, God. Uh, when you it's said cool the... to see. Go ahead. It's cool to see some places like that popping up in Pottstown. Like, you know, yeah. that, that town needs a little bit of a it revitalization. Does. It seems like there's cool things. Cool. It has potential, you know. There's a lot of there's a lot of people living here. Totally, like, yeah. That's not the problem. Something's wrong with the mall that they can't get their. I think the rent's high, so it's tough to get people to go in there. Yeah, I think a lot of malls are like that. In fact, my wife was just yeah. there to get something at the mall, and uh, she's like, "Yeah, you just walk in these certain parts where it's just completely dark because there's no stores, no lights, and you just gotta kind of cross these dark areas to a spot where there's light, and it's like, yeah." It's just shady. I think malls are tough for people these days. You know? Yeah. 
Well, when, when you mentioned the Bloodhound Gang, that took, that, oh, there's my dog. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it really took me back, not because of the late 90s stuff they did, but because of the early 90s stuff they did. Mm-hmm. They started out as a punk rock band, and they did a cover of uh, Kids in America. Oh, wow. No, no. Or was it Kids Incorporated? Yeah, I think it was Kids Incorporated. Okay, that, that makes sense. Yeah. And they I did a about them. Wow. They, they did a split with uh, the Bouncing Souls, and the cover was the seven inch cover was on uh, green construction paper. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I was never like the hugest fan of them, but the dude was super nice. And uh, I mean, I remember their like big hit that came out in like the late nineties or whatever. Yeah, but I know they were from around here, so like people around here like talk highly of the other people involved. You know, it's, it's, they're from the area. So it's Westchester, right? That think yeah westchester i think some of them are from royersford even like this yeah. area. you know i mean yeah, every time people ask me where i where i live because it's if you're not from around here you don't know but i'm just like it's it's where they film all those m night Shyamalan movies like yeah that's it's just a weird place you know like they film all those movies out here for a reason yeah. it's, it's cool but kind of kind of weird but it's close to a lot of different things you know you, you can it's I, I like it so far I've, I've i've enjoyed living here so yeah um because thinking about it now, as, as you've been talking to all the places you played, you're kind of a stone's throw away from Philadelphia, Delaware, uh, yeah. Allentown, uh, Reading. Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're kind of even Kutztown of Westchester. You got a yeah. lot of lot, lot to choose from. I mean, maybe your other band members are a little leery about driving out as far. But I've like especially Kutztown's got a great music. Uh, it's a great music town. Yeah, th- yeah, that's uh, that's what I've heard. I've been up to the record store up there. Um, yeah, you know the young ones, isn't that the one up in? I think so. Kutztown? I think so. Yeah, yeah, I know it's up up that way. But yeah, um, and the university up there is supposed to be pretty good. But yeah, I mean we're based in Philadelphia. We practice there, and um, the rest of the band is there, and um, we play there a bit. But we do well in Delaware too. Like I said, because I'm from originally from down there, um, so we play there pretty frequently. And um, yeah. you know, we do need, like we're we're playing New York next month at Auto Shrunken Head, uh, this show up there called Get Weird, which we're excited about. Yeah. But but yeah, there's so many good little pockets of places now, and these little small towns around here yeah. seem to be having a, a renaissance, you know, with clubs and stuff. Yeah, I think people are looking for something new to do. You know, I loved, um, I think it was called Old Town Newcastle. And yep. uh, it's beautiful. And I, I lived in uh, with my wife. We just got married. We lived in Newark. And okay. uh, we're about Newark. Uh, I, I forget the name of the neighborhood. But there was at the time, there was Gennardi's uh, yeah. in that in that little like the strip mall. And it's a safe way now. Right. But we went we were like right around the corner from that in that little neighborhood. Was it like was it like off of like Elkton Road, that Genardi's with the Goodwill. No, no, that one I think is up uh, by the movie theater, right? Um, no, a little bit farther south. Let me think. It, it doesn't matter, but yeah, I love, <laughs> I love living in Newark when, when I live there. I mean, it's a cool little college town, you know. What, yeah. What, what time? What, like, what what years were you living out that way? Right From two thousand two to two thousand six. Okay. So, I, yeah, there's like cool places like um Mojo Maine was was probably out there, like the old, where it used to be called the East End. Now it's I don't know what it's called now, but there were there were some cool clubs out there. Yeah, I like Newark, man. I always have a soft spot for that for sure. Yeah, me um, too. Uh, records is out that way. Yeah. Got a lot of good tattoo shops. Mm. Yeah, I, I knew a bunch of people that, that tattooed out there for a while and um Switch skate shop, buddy of mine owns uh, yeah. part of that down in New Orleans. Yeah, yeah. Switch, my friend uh, Joey Simpers. I grew up skating with him way back in the day, like in the in the eighties and nineties and stuff. So I used yeah, to get ta- cool. I used to get tattooed at August Moon. Do you know where that is? Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. What was the name of the dude who worked there? Well, the guy uh, that that used to tattoo me, he did portraits for me, and his name was Shane O'Neill. And okay. Uh, he wound up going on Ink Masters, and like, there's a couple of guys that tattooed me that want wa- that wound up on that show, and I think he won one year. And I'm like, holy shit, look at this guy, and and he definitely yeah. is a, he is a master at his craft. 
but on that show you kind of have to know a lot of different styles and uh yeah. but his specialty is portraits and like i i drive down from Pottstown if i'm gonna get a portrait just for him yeah i've heard he's good and i've heard i know a lot i don't have any tattoos myself but i know tons of people have gone to august moon i used to live with a guy too who tattooed there for a while i believe his name was brian he used to call him potsy um but i can't remember his, his, i can't remember his last name now off the top of my head um that was years and years ago but yeah he was like a big tattoo artist down there and stuff so i have to ask yeah, you where you well got for that i have to ask you about that that microphone it's a really cool microphone oh it's a short one it's called a shore 55 um super 55 i you know you see a lot of rockabilly guys use it um on stage and i started using it it's great it just has like a good response and i just love to like the vintage look but yeah, you, know, you can get him get him online it's super clean yeah yeah i'm sure the sound hopefully i figured it'd be a good one like i've noticed it's very responsive and using it for singing live it's great so i thought well i'll use it for the podcast interview because it'll sound better than a cheap you know um, awesome iphone mic or whatever you know right right that's why i got this thing uh I, I found even if I was sitting right up next to the computer, it sounded like I was all the way there in the back, you know? Yeah. Like that tin can sound, you know, yeah. sort of like real small thing. Yeah. So I see, yeah. I think I see a Telecaster hanging on the wall in the back. Yep. Yeah. That's one of my guitars. I got a Telecaster. I play it sometimes. Then I got a Gibson, like a hollow body. Uh, it's called an ES-135. Um, but I've had that for years. That's sort of like my main guitar that I use. The, the Gibson? Stage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Telecaster, I, I love it. And um, for playing lead stuff, it's it's great. And that thing is like a workhorse. Like, you could take a beating, you know. Um, but for singing and for what we do now, it's like the, the Gibson hollow body works a little bit uh, better for a lot of strumming chord kind of stuff. But um, right, right, if I'm right. doing anything punk rock or rock and roll, it's like I bring out the Telecaster. Yeah. Because that thing yeah. is great, you know. Well, tell me about your record. Reference. Tell me about your recording style. Uh, do you guys like share files, or do you, do you have a really cool studio you like to go to? Do you prefer analog or digital? Well, for this last record, um, for the full length we did, which is called "Come On Angels," uh, we recorded it in Philadelphia at a studio called Minor Street. I worked with uh, Brian McTeer, who's a producer who did stuff with. Sharon Von Eaton and Dr. Dog and the Dead Milkman and stuff like that. And so the great thing about that is that he does have a, a reel to reel two track, 24 track machine. So we were able to sort of record all the live tracks on the, onto the, uh, you know, through the reel to reel and then edit it on the computer, you know, like mix it on the computer and stuff. But we pretty much recorded most of the album, like most of it was done live, except for the vocals. We would just go and do scratch vocals and play the whole thing live. So the drums, the, bass like all the guitars were, were pretty much done live um some things were overdubbed and patched but we we did this album in a, in a in a in a bit of a different way we just we did it over five weekends we'd go in on a saturday and sunday and we'd record two song record and mix two songs over that over that weekend um and then we'd come back in another two weeks record another two songs and we did that right before the pandemic hit i mean we started in december 2019 and we got our final mixes and walked out of the door in March. And then two days later, everything shut down. Oh man. So it was crazy. But, um, but, and then we did a song recently though, over the summer uh, at Brian's studio, this, we did a recording of a Johnny Thunder's tune called disappointed in you. That's a and great tune. Johnny Thunder's. Yeah. I love that song. And um, it's a, uh, we did it for a Johnny Thunder's tribute show in New York. They were doing. And um, they asked us to be part of the live stream event. If we could record something live and submit it. So we did, but it was it was great because we recorded that song completely live, vocals and everything in the studio, and it came out sounding so good we decided to release it. So, you know, for the next time we might take more of that approach, just recording everything live, old school, just bleed. No, yeah. I went in a room and just just do it fully live because there's something that really that you really get to capture that way of being a live band if you can pull it off. You yeah, know? Um, lots of practice. I don't like like, yeah, and I, I, we've done some stuff where like I've done like I used to do some home recording and I helped run a studio for a while but with me I, I feel like if there's too many options i'll go down that rabbit hole and just will overanalyze and overwork things until it's um until it gets sort of almost destroyed like i like the idea of having a producer come in with an outside perspective that'll sort of tell you like well you're pushing this too far you're, you're fucking it up you know and that's what brian did brian told us a lot like nope don't 
don't add anything else. Like keep it simple. This is what you guys are. And let's like, you know, he kept us right. like on the path from just getting their own heads and being, yeah, you know, especially if you're the songwriter and you're the singer and you're the guitar player trying to record your own voice, trying to edit, you know, like, like, was that a good take? Did that sound good? I don't know. Like, who's, yeah. like that's really hard to um, be objective about the sound of your own voice, I think. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. Well, that new album is is great. Did you guys get to, did you, did you have to sit on it a little while? Or did you release it we, during the pandemic? We released it during the pandemic. I wasn't sure what to do, you know, because I mean, keep in mind at the time that was like April or March. I was like, oh, we're going to be back open by the summer. You yeah. Know, thing is, this would just be a few month thing. And so we thought, well, I knew a lot of other people were putting their records on the shelf and waiting. So we figured after talking to a, a woman that was doing publicity for us and stuff, we figured it would be a good time. There's kind of a lull and people were, were looking for stuff to listen to. So we did, we, uh, we, we put the album out, it came out in July of that, of 2020. But it was crazy because, it, you know, it, it's funny because the timing actually worked out really well because all of a sudden the album was getting ready to come out and I had nothing to do. Like all of our shows got canceled, but I had plenty to get done. I had to make the album cover artwork. I knew we had to make some, figure out a way to make some videos to promote the songs. I had to figure out a way to promote the record. So I just like, once the pandemic hit, just sort of locked myself in the room. Yeah went in and did all that so like there's a video that we that we did um for our song garner secrets here and that was recorded right at the beginning of the pandemic and uh i filmed that in this right here in this room with just an iphone and two mic two uh flashlights taped to mic stands so we get the right look and it was all done in the black and white and stuff so it was cool we're just sort of like well if we're gonna be stuck here i might as well figure out a way to make it to make it work and do something fun um so in a way, it was kind of a blessing in disguise, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the fact that you, like you and other other bands, took the approach where, well, I have a lot of free time. Rather than just sit on the couch and get depressed like everybody else, I'm going to get my nose to the grindstone and and get some things done that I can do it on my own. Yeah, you know, I think like there's never a perfect time for anything. You just got to work with whatever time you got at the moment and just yeah. and just and just go with it, you know. I like you know, uh nobody gets to, I I looked at it like when that happened, I was like, well, we're in a cocoon and you got to decide when you're in the cocoon what kind of butterfly you're going to be when it's time to come out, you know. Yeah. It's just enforced like okay, what are you going to do with your time? Like I, I you got and it was funny because leading up to the pandemic, I knew all these people that were just like always complaining, like, oh, I want to do this, but I don't have any time. I want to write my, make my film, make my album. And I just, I just never had any time. I'm so busy working. And then the minute everything got shut down, they're like complaining about not working and when are things going to get back to normal again? Like, <laughs> you, you've been given like, like a summer vacation, you know? Yeah. And I'm not making fun. Like, I don't want to like, you know, I'm, I'm self-employed. And at the time, like I, we lost a, a lot of our, our work, um, so it was like a, a tough time because we were like, we didn't know what, what was going to happen financially, you know? And so we just, you got to like buckle down. And I know people, you know, it was definitely hard for a lot of people, but I just thought, well, you just got to yeah. keep grinding forward, you know, and try to make the best of it. Yeah. So uh, that's what we tried to do. And it ended up being a positive experience in some, in some ways, you know? Can people get that out digitally as well as uh, like on CD or vinyl? Did you get any of that made with before? Yeah before the backup started yeah yeah um and we we've the album is available you know on all streaming streaming platforms apple music spotify title all that stuff um we do have it available on on vinyl if i got a copy of it here um you can order it on our website awesome um, you can also get it at, at stores like matones and collegeville we do have it on on cd as well awesome. um we got our first we got our first seven inch our first ep we released we have that on seven inch and cd too awesome um, you know they're available at all of our shows or like i said you can get them on our website at, at you can go to mightyjoecastro.com or at thegravamen.com um and if you go to our like our, our instagram and stuff there's links for all that stuff for all the awesome so yeah if you want to listen to music we got we got you covered no matter what way you want to do it except for cassettes or eight tracks <laughs> on that route yet but we'll see <laughs> uh, so did you get to put that out yourself did you guys do everything get it pressed and and, and promote it and put it out yourselves or did you yeah. partner yeah. with somebody 
No, no, we didn't. Um, for the for the full length record, yeah, we put it out completely ourselves. I found um, got got the records pressed from Gotta Groove, which is out in um, Ohio, I think. I think they pressed the records for us, and um, yeah, it's just totally self released. Actually, a, a cool side note for our first EP we did, the Wake Up Your Rockin' Seven Inch. Um, we got Adam from Matone's Records from the record shop actually gave us some money to help get the records pressed. Just oh, to awesome. sort of help support the scene. So it's really cool. Um, if you look on the back of the records, it says, uh, you know, sponsored in part by Matone's and it has this sort of logo on there. Um, oh, awesome. But that was cool. It, when he offered that, I thought this, this is great because that's just like, you know, record, like bands need record stores, record stores need bands. Like it, it, yeah. it's cool to, to support each other, you know? Anything that brings that kind of sense of community, um, I think it's just important because we need that now more than ever, you know? Yeah, People totally. Working, working together, you know? That's why I wanted to do the podcast because I knew you were local and I was like, well, this guy's like in Pottstown trying to do something cool. Like, you know, like I got to support it. You know what I mean? We got to like awesome. support each other. So that's sort of my attitude at least. Yeah, totally. Totally. And, and that's why I work with, with independent labels and bands because... I figure as much as I love the music, they don't get nearly, they don't have the power behind them as much as like a big record label uh, yeah, yeah. To, to get the word out. Um, and, it, and I just found myself as just one outlet to get, to get the word out on, on YouTube, you know? So I chose a platform uh, to get the word out that way. And um I find out it works pretty well. Yeah, I think like nowadays it's, it's hard for bands to break through because there's so many bands. Yeah. You have, you know, everyone's sort of doing the same thing. But, um, you know, back in the day, a major label could take a band and just saturate them on MTV, saturate them on the radio. And like the songs just get stuck in your head, just the sheer repetition of it. Yeah. It would, you know, like they would sell a lot of records. And nowadays, like that isn't even like a thing, you know? Yeah. And think about it, like in the eighties and nineties, would you have like a thirty channels to listen to? Now with YouTube, it's like, you know, like it's just, it's just different. There is no sort of major outlet. Like no one's listening to the radio like they did. Yeah. There's no MTV. There's no. So I think it's harder for a band to really push through and do it on on their own. But at the same time, it's it costs a lot less, and you can do it because you have yeah. so many other outlets. So you just got to go out there and sort of do it old school, and just like person by person, and just go out there and like you know put the mileage in so do you guys have a youtube channel yeah uh, i have a personal one mighty joe castro is the is the handle you go on there that has all of our gravamen videos there's some other art stuff that i've done on there but it's mostly music <laughs> stuff i i first of all i apologize for saying your name incorrectly uh <laughs> oh no, no that's fine that's fine um it's funny i've heard it pronounced we actually pronounce it incorrectly ourselves because um the Gravaman, the name, at the time, we didn't know what we were going to call ourselves. And then I found that word randomly on um, like one of those word of the day calendars or something. Uh -huh. Down the word of the day said Gravaman, but it's, I think it's pronounced, it's a legal term. It's pronounced Gravaman, and it's about uh, a complainer or a person who makes a complaint. Oh, so I thought, well, that's great to have a band of complainers. So but we thought <laughs> the Gravaman sounds cooler. But we just started going with the Gravaman. And now it's it's perfect because anytime someone comes up to me and corrects me and says, no, it's Gravaman, I'd say, yeah, well, you're obviously a lawyer. So thank you very much. And, you know, now I know where you stand and keep your hands out of my pockets. <laughs> so before we go, uh, oh, I wanted to tell you, we linked yesterday, I put the link up uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, I like to get everybody who has a YouTube channel and is on the show I uh, or have I have reviewed or my wife has reviewed their music. We put all links to their YouTube channels on the feature channels playlist. Uh, so if people want to find your music or your videos, they can link to they can click the link in on our channel and go to go to see your your music, the Joe Castro channel. Cool, cool, awesome. Thank you, I appreciate that. <clears throat> Yeah, and I'll man. do the same too. We'll, we'll, we'll cross promote as much as possible and get get the word out. You know. Yeah, man, that's the only way you could do it is if you know everybody helps each other. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I've I've checked out your a bunch of your shows. It's you have a wide 
um, like some of the bands I've recognized and we've um, and I've known, and then other ones I'm like I've never heard of these people, and you check them out, and you're like it's pretty cool, you know. But I know there's yeah. some of the surf bands. Did you have the Bali Lamas on recently? Yeah, uh, a couple weeks ago. Yep, they're from Baltimore. Yeah, we played a show with. Yeah, we played a show with them a few years ago. Like super nice guys, great, great band. Yeah. Um, so yeah, once in a while I'll see something. I'm like, oh, I know that band. Oh, cool. Like this is this is great. Like you, I don't know how many episodes you've done, but it seems like it's a lot. Now you've covered a lot of different styles. Which yeah, it's awesome. I think we have. I think this will be the 211th interview I've done in like the past year. So wow. I've been doing it just over a year. So I, I'm trying yeah. to trying to push ahead and, and build a, a good foundation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's super cool. Yeah, I mean that, that's great. That's a lot of episodes, you know. And it's yeah. awesome you're giving these bands a, a platform to you know to get the word out there, man. Because this kind of music needs it. You know, we don't have a big uh, yeah big push. You know, the underground, the surf music, rockabilly, garage, all that yeah. stuff. Like it's just I love it, man. You know, awesome. Do you do you know uh, Double Crown Records? I don't think so. Where are they based out of? Uh, California, I I think L.A., but but I'm not okay, sure. Yeah, they, yeah. they may be San Francisco. But look up Sean Barry, and he puts out this scene for rockabilly oh. and and uh, surf music. Uh, he's a big supporter of both genres. He puts out a, a zine called The Continental, and every it's, it's a quarterly zine. And oh, every, I've seen that. Yeah, that's him. I've seen that zine, The Continental. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I was just reading something about that actually. Yeah, it's Maybe really I've about that guy. It's good exposure. Good exposure. If okay, you, you can contact him to get on the the quarterly comp that he does. It comes with the magazine. And I'm sure he put you on there. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'll look into that. Continental. What was lately said? Crown Crown Records? Double Crown. Double Crown. Okay. And the, and the dude's, write that down before I forget. The dude's name is uh Sean Barry. He's a really nice guy. He's a re really hard worker. Um, he has a like a web store, he's a record label, he does it uh this the zine still. It's just uh He's really immersed in the culture and, you know, he's all about helping awesome. sur surf and rockabilly, you know, anything to push it forward. Cool. I'll definitely check that out for sure. Thanks for that heads up. I yeah, no problem. That. Well, is there anything yeah. else, Joe, that you wanted to talk about that I might may not have touched upon? Um, let me think. I think that's pretty much that's that's most of it. Uh, one thing we have been doing something uh, for the last few few years. It's giving out these um, rockability against racism stickers. Start doing this a few. Um, okay. I started doing it in 2019. So it's something that we've been doing around the scene. Anyone that asks, we give them uh, stickers and other things like that. We've done a couple, but we're planning a couple of benefits for different organizations and stuff like that. Just trying to push a more um, inclusive attitude toward the, toward the, especially toward the rockability scene. Our attitude is kind of uh, vintage style, not vintage values. So yeah. If anyone wants the rockabilly against racism sticker, they're more than welcome to reach out to me on social media, you know, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Send me an email, even at mighty Joe Castro at gmail.com. And I'll put some stickers in the mail for you for free. No charge. Um, you know, we got, we got these little pins as well, stuff like that. So we've been, we've awesome. been doing that just trying to put some positivity out there in the scene. And um, other than that, just working on a new record, trying to write some songs and get that going. Hopefully we'll record it later this year and either put it out fourth quarter this year or, or early um, next year, sort of the plan at the moment. So we're just, we're just continuing moving forward, try to play as many shows in as many places as we can this year. Hopefully get out to the West coast this year as well. We'll see. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah. All right, man. Well, thank you so much, Joe. It was really uh, a pleasure talking to you. Um, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. It got a little off the music, but uh I think that's what, what people appreciate is getting to know the person behind the music. Yeah, man. Any, any podcast or interview I do, it always goes a little bit off the music. Off the music <laughs> as long as it's interesting and people aren't bored, I think that's the important part. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm down to talk about whatever. So, yeah, I appreciate the conversation. I totally did. It was good. Awesome. Good talk. Well, you have a great rest of your day, and, and thanks for doing this. I know we're at, at noon on a Monday. It's President's Day, 
And I know it, you being self-employed, you don't get a day off. So I appreciate your time. <laughs> and uh, no, it's totally cool. I actually forgot it was a holiday. I was like, oh, in the middle of the work week, that's perfect. Like, this is great. Like, you know, but yeah, yeah, yeah no problem, man. It was, it was good. So. All right, man, you have a, you have a great day and uh, good luck writing the new tunes. And uh, I look forward to hearing them. Thanks, man. And thanks again for having me. I appreciate it. Sincerely. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, man. Take care. You too. Cheers.